a look at justice in Harris County, please welcome Kim Ogg, the District Attorney of Harris County, Loretta Ray, a case manager and supervisor at the Salvation Army of Houston, Alex Bunnan, the Chief Public Defender of Harris County, Teresa May, the Director of Harris County Community Supervision and Corrections Department, and Judge Brock Thomas, who oversees Harris County's Responsive Interventions for Change docket. Here to lead the conversation, welcome Atlantic Senior Editor, Ron Brownstein. Good morning, everybody, and good morning, uh, panelists. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot of specifics in the, in the next half hour, uh, policies on uh, diversion, uh, on uh, criminal justice reform, on public safety, but I'd like to start uh, by asking all of you a broad question. When, when, you, uh, when you think about the criminal justice system today uh, in Harris County, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge? What is the biggest problem that reform efforts should be focused on solving? How do you define the goal before we get to the means of achieving the goal? And District Attorney Ogg, maybe you could start us. Well, public safety is what people expect out of the criminal justice system, but they want it handled fairly. And so I think a big challenge is regaining the public's trust that we live in a free society, we have need for uh, law and order, but we can do it in a way that is applied equally. And I think that's where people see the inequity in the past. So that's a challenge. And then locally, post the biggest national disaster mm -hmm. and natural disaster in our country, our local system is particularly challenged because we are still displaced. Our courts, our probation department, our prosecutors, our public defenders, uh, and we're scattered throughout the city giving us difficult logistics just in terms of getting to court. Mm -hmm. The public faces the same problems. These are county governance and city governance issues. Uh, and they're bigger than any one of us in the system, and yet we're all affected by it. More importantly, the people are affected by it. Loretta, you've been through the system. What, what do you see as the biggest challenge? Uh, the biggest challenge, I would have to agree with uh, District Attorney Og that, you know, the uh, bus being in the post-Harvey uh, with the crisis that's going on, a lot of disparities between um, individuals who are less fortunate um, homeless individuals, especially with me being on the ground level of engaging these individuals. Um, the displacement of people, like I mentioned yesterday, mm -hmm. going to court systems with uh, clients and trying to support them and them not knowing where they're going, um, that's, that's a major concern as well. Um, I also think that um, the lack of um, a trauma-informed uh, approach is a big issue as well as to people um, entering into the criminal system uh, and just continuing to cycle through. Define trauma-informed approach, what do you mean? So the trauma-informed approach is just realizing that the people that are, we're 30, 40 years old now mm -hmm. cycling through homelessness and criminal justice systems, but we were once children uh, who may have experienced some form of trauma and it affects our coping skills and committing minor offenses, drug offenses, things like that, and not having the resources available to address those issues, <coughs> mental health the issues, substance abuse, abuse yeah, issues. Well, I begin with the premise that the criminal justice system is a repository for all society's problems. This is where they go. So addiction, mental health, uh, race, and uh, poverty are all problems that we deal with in the criminal justice system, but they're not problems we deal with well because criminal justice is the most expensive and inefficient way to deal with those issues. So I, I think what we need to keep in mind is that we should do the least harm and do that by only prosecuting when we really need to, not burdening people with uh, fines and fees, uh, making sure that we can get people's records cleared up so that it doesn't follow them for the rest of their lives. So, uh, again, d do the least harm is, is what I think is, is my biggest issue. We'll come back to that and, and this question of whether the problems within the system, the problems of the criminal justice system can be solved primarily within the system or from changes outside. Uh, uh, but Dr. May? 
I would say overwhelmingly the biggest challenge is a lack of resources. Mm. We, are, we have many, many people who need services, treatment. It, it, the criminal justice system at this point in community supervision, we do treatment and work with individuals to try to help them get their lives on, on track. And there are many, many systems in our community that are underfunded as well. The mental health system, education, those kinds of things that have already been a failure in their lives. So the needs are, are great. And a recognition that the needs are very, very complex. Mm. So the example of trauma-informed treatment, she's exactly right. You know, educating people on what that means. Someone that's been through trauma is going to see the world a little bit different. And educating everyone working with those people how to recognize that is really important. So resources overwhelmingly and the recognition that it's it's not simple. It's it's very complex. Judge Thomas. Sure. I I mean, I would echo what everybody else on the panel had said, um, obviously those and other issues. You won't go last always, but I, I promise. It's okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think one of our challenges is obviously we all recognize anybody that's been in or around our criminal justice system that there's obviously need for and a necessity for improvement and to continue at that. Obviously, there can be differences of opinion on how far, how broad, how deep. Mm. But I think one of our challenges is taking that recognition that there needs to be improvement and how do we translate that into tangible things that actually move the ball forward. We spend a lot of time, unfortunately, many times talking about the things that we may disagree on, but there are a number of things that we do agree on. How do we then you know, focus in on this, those things? And, and I think, for example, some of the work through the Coordinating Council uh, for Harris County Government and all of the stakeholders through the safety justice challenge and through MacArthur, you know, we've seen some examples of that where it's not the be all end all and it's not perfect, but you know, how can we, you know, again, move from recognition of those challenges and those shortcomings and, and find tangible things that we can do to make a difference with that? And I think we'll speak further. Yeah, about let, that. let me follow up on that because, uh, you know, if you look at the data, uh, the incarceration rate in the Harris County Jail is well below the peak in the 90s and well below where it was even in 2010, but it's still relatively at the higher end of the, of the range of the past 40 years. And as part of that grant that you cited, uh, you've committed to reducing that by about 20% in the next three years. As you look at that goal, which is a, which is a substantial goal, what are your greatest points of leverage? Where do you think you can make the most difference uh, in reducing the incarceration rate without, as the DA started, threatening public safety. Yeah. Well, I think there's a number of different ways, and again, there's not one be-all, end-all to that. Um, I think, for example, the response of interventions to change, or formerly our reintegration court, that's a name. I mean, we're an example of that, where you know we recognize and understand, you know, that we have a number of people. Since inception of uh, October of 16, almost 8,000 cases for less than a gram felony amount drug cases. And when you add in the one to four grams that we've recently taken on, but we've all recognized that with that population, we can do better. We can look to see more of those folks. How can we get people out of jail to begin with? Explain how the experience of an offender in that court would differ from what they would have faced before. Typically before, Somebody charged with one of those offenses would go to one of 22 district courts, and there are obviously all kinds of different things that could happen with that. Being mindful that those cases would be handled and on dockets that are inter intermingled with your rapes, murders, robberies, and everything mm -hmm. else in between. Now, as opposed to those being spread out, they come through a centralized docket where we deal ex with those exclusively with those issues. Try to get more people out to begin with, because we obviously know, and, and the, the goal is obviously to reduce the jail population, reduce the number of people go there, how long they stay there, and obviously reduce the numbers that come back. Try to get people out, try to get people as appropriate, connected with appropriate therapeutic programming, whether it's drug treatment, whether it's getting connected to mental health services mm -hmm. when they've never been connected or reconnected whole bunch of other things that go along with that, housing and all the other things, and I could go on and on with that. But to try to take you know, a, a, a proper assessed approach, get people evaluated for what they need, and get people connected with those things. Obviously, some of those cases, people are charged and they need a trial or a motion to suppress. Those cases then get um, uh, sent back out to the district courts to handle that. But we've disposed of, of the 8,000 or so, 5,000 or so at our court. And a lot of those have been dismissed and that was the appropriate resolution. If that's the just result, getting that quicker is better for everyone. But 
historically before those cases, many of them would have did result in being in jail at the time of their disposition, taking small amounts of jail time and coming back over and over again. And we have flipped that. More people out, vast majority of people getting placed in either pretrial interventions where their case can be dismissed and ultimately expunged or deferred adjudications for people that historically would not have got it. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth offenders where it just didn't work before. They need treatment. We need to get people connected with the appropriate resources. And so, again, it's a work Are in the progress. resources there? Uh, we need more. Hmm. No doubt. Yeah. Loretta, you're nodding when I was asking about whether the appropriate resources are there if you divert. Yeah, the, the resources are scarce. Uh, the resources are not there. I think back in the uh, early and late 90s um, where individuals would be arrested for having paraphernalia. And uh, in those times, people would get 25-year sentences mm. where um, they would do a short amount of time because I think it was uh, a month or so per year, but then they would come out without the resources um, that could help them to sustain and become um, productive citizens in society, and then they reoffend um, because they go back to their addictions, and then they're back in the system on a parole violation, and then it's just that come repeated cycle. So let me go back to the, the, the question that I, that I asked Judge, Dr. May, what, are the, what do you see as the most significant points of leverage to reduce the jail population without increasing risk to public safety? Well, you know, one of the things that we do in the reintegration, or I'm sorry, the resource of intervention uh, for change court is to do a good assessment. You know, it's really important that we meet people where they are. Mm. I don't want anyone making assumptions about what someone may need just because of what they were arrested for. So we start with a very extensive uh, assessment for the people that we serve. We want to make sure that we are meeting the needs that are causing the issues. And obviously the resources are critical to mm. that. But the ultimate goal is to give people the skills and the needs that are, are causing issues, remove those barriers so that they can live a productive life. They don't come back. And that's, you know, really the end goal. We want to get people what they need and get their lives turned around so they don't continue to cycle in and out. Get them back with families, get them jobs. And mm. ultimately, that is a smart move because, you know, the rearrest rates were 70% yeah. Yeah. before we were doing this with people doing short mm. amounts of time. Mm. And the only thing that they were getting was a conviction and no treatment, no services, no change. Our goal is to help people get their lives back on track and get the things that they've missed. So it's a lot to do, but it, it is working. The rearrest rates are significantly lower under this model. I'd say two issues. One, avoid arresting people because for instance, uh, we specialize in representing severely mentally ill people charged with misdemeanors, so trespass, prostitution, petty theft. A lot of those cases uh, wouldn't be filed. They would take them for crisis intervention to the psychiatric center, but sometimes the psychiatric center is full. They can only hold them for a short period of time, so they end up in the criminal justice system. So that's one thing. The other thing is, for all cases, uh, we need more pretrial release. We need more people let out, waiting for their case to be mm -hmm. resolved. Uh, I was a federal public defender for 20 years. In the federal system, money bail is the last resort. In our system, traditionally, yeah. it's been the first resort, and it's kept a lot of people in custody. Yeah, like, like in most places, what, you're at three quarters of your jail population is in a pretrial, or roughly what percentage? Mm -hmm. uh, and that obviously raises the question of, of the bail system, uh, on which you have been engaged <laughs> in extensive and ongoing litigation. Where do things stand now? What are the prospects for a settlement that reforms the bail system in Harris County? Well, our county government has spent $8 million or close to it defending uh, an archaic uh, wealth-based bail system. I think that's wrong. Uh, we do need a risk-based system that allows us to present evidence of people's danger to the community so that a judge can make a factual decision about whether or not to release that person. But our system isn't set up to do that. So we've had this lawsuit 
uh, but the actual answers, I think, will be determined once when the lawsuit is finalized, but second by our legislature. And remember, this is the same legislature elected by the people uh, that has not adequately funded our mental health system, our education system. And so I think we need to look at broad changes in the law to ultimately fix the bail system. So just to be clear, just to be, uh, just to be clear, even if the lawsuit is settled, you don't think that is the ultimate so that will not take you all of the way toward the solutions that you believe are necessary. It won't, because under the current system, regardless of how dangerous you are, if you have enough money to make the bail, regardless of how high the judge sets it, you get out of jail. Mm -hmm. Whereas the poorest person, regardless of how low their risk is, if they cannot make the bail, then they cannot get out of jail. The lawsuit only affects misdemeanor cases right now. And those are easier to deal with. Uh, and I think that the, it, it's, the, it's the waste of resources at a time when we need them so much that I think is, is frustrating. But what the public needs to understand is that you're just not, your interests really aren't being protected. Your interest as the public, at least uh, my family's are, is we wanna be safe in our homes. Well, well, there is, Judge, there, there's a perspective on the other side. There, there, there have been those who criticize the idea of reforming bail practices on the, I, on the notion that this is going to lead to more people on the street who might commit other crimes. Are they right to be concerned that reforming the system could produce more threats to public safety, or are reform and safety compatible by allowing more focus and concentration uh, on the most dangerous? Judge, let me ask you. Your, your well, thought. <laughs> um, look, I, I think as it is with our criminal, criminal justice system as a whole, pretrial uh, uh, justice being a part of that, there's certainly room for improvement at that, no question. Um, uh, you know, there are things that were in process and in process that have been in place with regard to use of the Arnold tool, for example, on our pretrial uh, assessments that are being utilized and were in the works at or, at or near the time of the lawsuit. I'm not familiar exactly with all of the timing of it. Look, I, I don't know how the lawsuit shakes out at the end of the day. Um, I think we will have moved forward wherever it shakes out. I think even that being the case, there will still, and I agree that there will still be work to be done. The, mm -hmm. the, the end of the lawsuit is not going to end that issue, that there will still need to be things that are worked programmatically, systematically, and even legislatively. Obviously, when you talk about one aspect of it, uh, as the district attorney had mentioned, with regard to preventative detention, if you mm -hmm. will, for certain mm -hmm. cases, we're very limited by constitution and statute in terms of the type of narrow circumstances where somebody can be held without bail. Yeah. But uh, obviously, this is a tough issue and a lot of strong opinions about it. I uh, understand that. I, I don't pretend to speak for any and all judges. I, I, on a good day, I can speak for myself, yeah. so I won't try to speak for <laughs> yeah. all the others. But I, we all recognize that clearly there's room for improvement on that. There can be differences of opinion on scope. But whatever happens with the lawsuit, there will still be work that needs to be done on that. That I am Alex, from your, Alex, from your vantage point, how far can the lawsuit get toward resolving the issues in the bail system? Uh, only so far. It, mm -hmm. I mean, it it's a, has to be a cultural change. It has to be everyone buys into the fact that there is some risk in releasing people. But especially when you're talking about misdemeanor persons, the risk is typically not that they're going to commit mm -hmm. a murder. The risk is that, well, they might not show up in court or they might commit another trespass. Um, so you really have to look at it objectively and, and understand that we are paying a lot of money and keeping a lot of people in jail over issues that I don't believe are necessarily public safety the way the public thinks about public safety. They don't want to be robbed. They don't want to be burglarized. But we keep a lot of people in jail uh, just under the, the premise that maybe, even if they're not particularly risky themselves, maybe that increases the harm to public safety. Well, and, and this goes to the broader question, not, not solely about bail, but about the whole uh, uh, thrust of reform. Uh, there are those like the Attorney General, uh, Jeff Sessions, in, in speeches who have basically argued that reform and safety are 
uh, inimical, that, that, that basically you increase the risk by demanding more accountability from police or different, different practices in the criminal justice system. What is your response to that? What is there, are, 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 is, does reform come at the cost of public safety or can the two be synergistic? I am confident that not only can, is reform compatible with public safety, reform is required to make us safer. We have to work out these problems at, on bail, uh, the problems with what we do with our mentally ill other than jail them. Uh, how we handle drug offenders, are we going to warehouse them or are we going to treat them or even move that eventually out of the criminal justice system so that we can focus on the crimes that people care about that Alex mentioned, burglary, robbery, rape, murder. So I have uh, 31 years experience as a lawyer in Harris County and it is uh, my absolute belief that the data, the evidence that our administration is producing in terms of focusing on violent crimes and property crimes, not on drug crimes, and trying to move the mentally ill and drug offenders through and out or even stop them from coming in the system will make us safer. When we keep people in the workforce and when we stop disqualifying from the workforce and we allow people and encourage them and give them the resources to be employed, we are a safer society. But, but let me ask you this. I mean, like many cities, the violent crime rate in Houston is much lower than it was in the 90s or even the early 2000s. But it has ticked back up as in many cities from 2013 through 2016 at least, which are the statistics uh, that uh, I think the most recent uh, data that's available. Is that a blip? Is there something happening? Uh, wh what is your sense? I mean, is there a reason for people to be concerned about, their, about the trend lines at least? Uh, understanding that at an absolute level we're much lower than we were two decades ago, Many cities have seen an increase in the last several years. Dr. May, any thoughts on that? Well, one thing to keep in mind, I mean, Harris County and the city have been growing. Mm -hmm. So depending on how they're looking at the rates and how people are coming in, you know, there need to be adjustments. But, you know, I think you're always going to see trends. We've seen that off and on for quite some time, but again, we have major system failures even before people get to the criminal mm -hmm. justice system. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to that point, we are on a, we're going uphill, trying to get people what they need to turn their lives around. Um, the preventative detention is an issue. You know, the very fact that, that courts see individuals who we know are dangerous and they have to set a bond, even a high bond, and we see people make it, that's a challenge. That does need to be addressed. Uh, we need to be able to have the time to make sure that we know who we are dealing with. The PSA has come a long way in providing a tool to help us with many things. There's a violence flag. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's a balance of safety and justice. And again, we have to have the resources to help people get where they need to go. And we have to work together as yeah. a community and as a system. Judge I mean, obviously, when it comes to crime rates and all that, you know, a lot of that's dependent on my perspective. If you're a victim of it, then it's high. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, if you haven't, maybe you've done a little differently. But I, I, getting back to what the district attorney said, I, I agree that I, I don't, the, the argument that it has to be one or the other, you know, reform or safety at the expense of the other, I, I don't think in a lot of circumstances has to be that way. And I think, for example, the collaboration that's gone into how we're dealing with these lower level drug offenses mm -hmm. at a felony level is an example of that. There's not much daylight between any of us in terms of difference of opinion of how to address that. And there's been complete buy-in by the district attorney. We've even expanded it from dealing from less than a gram cases to one to four gram cases now. We all understand and recognize if we do better with those cases, that's better for those individuals, that's better for a system. And it also frees up time and resource to be able to deal with the trials and the handling and the disposition of those violent cases. Loretta, let, let me bring you in before, before we turn to the audience, because the paradox is that many of the same, often it's the same communities that feel most at risk from over-incarceration or the way police are treating uh, you know, uh, individuals, and yet also face the greatest risk statistically of crime. How do you balance in your mind? Uh, it, it, is, is there a cost to safety and reform, or does reform create safer communities? 
I believe that reform will um, balance out the, 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 the safety concern in, in the city. Um, but it's all back to the resources again, because uh, an individual can continue to go in and out of the criminal justice system, but if there's no resources available for them when they come out, then they are in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times they do things to survive and then they reoffend. And so um, in speaking to the fact of, as we spoke last night at the round table, um, individuals who um, get criminal backgrounds, they're screwed for housing and employment opportunities. So then what choices do they have at that point? I think all of you have made the point, and we'll bring in the audience, that uh, there are limits to how much changes inside the criminal justice system itself can solve the problems right. that, th that, are, that are apparent in the criminal. And in many ways, it requires changes outside in terms of education and economic opportunity and social services. Alex, is that where right. you... You started right. that way, housing, downstream. Housing. Yeah, housing, health care, all these things that uh, people are not getting outside of the criminal justice system often cause them to come into the criminal justice system, and we do a, a very poor job of serving them in those needs. Mm -hmm. So uh, the better we can do on the front end, uh, a lot, you know, a lot, it's hard when you're dealing with governments that have to spend money and they think of short term, what is this right. going to cost? A lot of these things are long term costs, but, in the, but you end up saving money because yeah. you have less people in jail, you have more people without uh, chronic health needs, and you solve those problems, but you have to look in the long run. Let's bring in the audience. I think, do we have some microphones, questions? Oh, over there. Hello, my name is Seconda Joseph with BLMHTX, Imagine More. And as you were talking about the question of reform and safety, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was, you know, the public was, who is the public that you're speaking about? And who is safe? Uh, because one of the things that we're not talking about is we're not saying that the, the public, the spe specific people we're talking about uh, are black people and our brown people who are already not safe. Uh, my brothers, my nephews, my cousins, my family, we're not safe in our communities. Uh, and <clears throat> in addition to that, my question is, we do acknowledge there, there are a lot of problems with systems everywhere, but where can we start? And I would even suggest with the criminal uh, justice system, one of the areas that we can kind of start at the heart is the way that folks are uh, interact with police from the beginning. Because white children that I went to school mm. with who had drug problems and who had mm. trauma are not experiencing this. Mm. Um, and if we're gonna talk about race and justice, we have to talk about race. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's any question that there's been a disparity in the way laws have been enforced, especially when it comes to the drug laws. Anybody who's uh, read Michelle Alexander's book uh, about the new Jim Crow and the way that drug laws came about and the enforcement uh, as it was pushed from the federal government, from President Nixon down. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of disparity. Not only have we... Uh, have we damaged the communities where laws have been enforced unequally? But I think we've damaged their economic opportunity. When we over-police uh, drug crimes in the Third Ward and not in River Oaks, we lower the property values in those areas by calling them high crime. And so how we're safe in many ways depends on how we count crime. If you mm. count number of arrests as making you safer, well then the areas where we make the most arrests should be the safest, but they're often not. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take a shift in the way the population looks at how you're safe. As long as we agree it's not quantity, it's quality that no neighborhood wants rapists, that no neighborhood wants burglars to go uh, unapprehended. I think until we do that, 
we're going to have disparity. Our diversion program, I made our marijuana program apply to all who possessed it, regardless of criminal background, for that reason, because there have been more minority young people arrested and convicted in drug crimes than, than non-minority members. And so mm. it just seemed the only way we could bring equality to diversion was to make it apply to everybody, regardless of their past history if all they possessed was a small amount of drugs. And the carrot on the stick for law enforcement is that it will free police officers up on the street to answer calls for mm -hmm. service from people in trouble. Let's get one more from this side, yes. Mm -mm -mm. Yes, my name is Pastor James Nash. I got a question, Kim and all the panel here. How much approximately does it cost to incarcerate an individual? What's the cost for that? What is it? The question was, how much does it cost? The, to the cost of incarcerating marijuana offenders in this county was $27 million a year for every year for 10 years up until 2016. That's what we, we researched. Uh, on, on the 47th day of my administration, we, along with all the police agencies in this town, stopped arresting people for misdemeanor amounts of marijuana. Instead, they're diverted into an education class. We, we've, we've got to run off the stage, but can I ask real quick before we go, do you feel that the 2016 election was a lasting turning point toward a different approach in law enforcement in Harris County, or do you feel that the changes that you're making are still contested and subject to possibly being reversed? Alex? Oh, okay, I'm not elected, but... I know. <laughs> uh, I think it's, we're in flux. I think there, there are gonna to continue to be changes, but I think th the wave is toward reform. Judge? You know, that's hard to say. Uh, I, you know, I, I think no matter what that is, I think it, clearly the issue of reform and taking a mm. deeper, harder look at everything criminal justice and what we could do to improve it, uh, that's in front of us and, and, and that's going to be an issue going forward. Dr. No May? What. Yeah, I've consistently, for the people that I work with every day on the coordinating council, from the district attorney mm. to the sheriff, judges, commissioners, the public defender, we all want change. Everyone wants to do it better. I don't see reform uh, going backwards. I think we're going to continue to move forward. Loretta, Loretta and then the DA last, maybe? Uh, well, I, I'm not elected either, but right. I work with the people. Right, who do uh, the electing? I'm out in the trenches working with the people, so I see the effects um, that happen. So I am hopeful that with this uh, reintegration course and, and, and added resources, that there will be a change. Okay. Well, I think the data is the evidence that we present the public and you decide every election whether we're governing in the way that you want us to. All right, join me in thanking this panel. Thank you. Okay.